There are winters that do not come from the sky, but from the earth itself. When a mountain explodes, the heavens dim, and ash travels farther than prayers. In the Middle Ages, such eruptions darken noons into twilight and turn summers into frost. Crops blackened before ripening, rivers froze in June, and the poor starved beside fields of ruin. They didn't know about aerosols or sulphate veils. They only knew that God had turned his face away. This is the story of volcanic winters, when the planet breathed fire and humankind answered with famine and prayer. From the 6th to the 15th century, the medieval sky witnessed something the people could not name, the slow fading of the sun. Across Europe and Asia, dawns rose dim and days remained cold, as if the heavens themselves were covered by a funeral shroud. In reality, immense volcanic eruptions had hurled dust and sulphur high into the stratosphere, scattering sunlight and lowering global temperatures by one to three degrees. But for medieval villagers, there was no science to explain the strange chill. The world grew quieter, the birds delayed their songs, and the soil refused to awaken. Farmers looked to the heavens and saw only haze. No warmth, no mercy. Chronicles describe dry fogs, that turned the air copper and left the people frightened, believing the end of days had begun. Across monasteries and castles, priests urged repentance, while peasants whispered that the sun had been chained for mankind's sins. In truth, these were volcanic winters, invisible clouds stretching across continents. The harvest shrank, bread prices rose, and hunger moved through villages like an invisible beast. Yet through their fear, the people began to record, observe, and remember. Those first trembling entries in parchment, accounts of strange darkness and dying crops, would one day become the foundation for climate history. By all accounts, the year 536 was the worst to be alive. The Byzantine historian Procopius wrote that the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon, for nearly a whole year. Across Europe, the Middle East and Central Asia, summer turned to winter overnight. Frost covered the fields, rain fell like ash and crops withered before they could be gathered. People ate bark, roots, and the flesh of dead animals. Livestock starved, markets emptied. Entire families wandered in silence, searching for food among frozen forests. It was a famine so vast that it crossed borders, languages, and faiths. Some blamed demons, others the wrath of God. Modern science reveals what they could not. A colossal volcanic eruption, likely in Iceland or Alaska, had filled the atmosphere with aerosols. The earth, in effect, created its own shadow. This artificial winter lasted for years, marking the beginning of one of the darkest centuries in human memory. The chill that began in 536 did not stop with the crops. It seeped into civilizations. Epidemics followed, empires fractured, and migrations reshaped entire continents. For those who lived through it, the world itself seemed cursed, as if heaven had collapsed into ash. Yet from that desolation, new eras began to form, proof that even after the longest night humanity still sought the light. The years that followed 536 felt endless, as if winter had forgotten how to die. Each time the earth began to warm, another eruption somewhere on the planet pulled the sun back behind its veil. Snow fell in June, rivers froze in August, grain rotted in barns, and migratory birds fell from the sky, unable to find their way through the haze. Historians now call this long age of cold the late antique Little Ice Age, a century of trembling balance between life and extinction. Across continents, empires weakened under skies that refused to clear. The Sasanian dynasty in Persia faltered. In India, the Gupta Empire vanished into drought and war. In East Asia, records speak of red sunsets, unending fog, and strange lights in the heavens. For ordinary people, survival became a ritual. A loaf of warm bread or a bowl of soup was no longer sustenance. It was salvation. Hunger stalked every home, and yet hope persisted in tiny acts, the sharing of a crust, the planting of seeds despite the frost. Through hardship, humanity discovered its most ancient truth, that endurance is a form of faith. Though the eruptions of Tambora in 1815 and Krakatoa in 1883 came centuries after the Middle Ages, they remain echoes of what medieval eyes once saw. Tambora alone dimmed the planet by more than three degrees, creating the year without a summer in 1816. Across Europe, crops failed, rivers froze, 
and snow fell on green fields. Contemporary accounts describe skies of rust and sunsets that bled across the horizon. Artists painted the eerie glow, Turner's blazing skies, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein written by candlelight amid the cold. The atmosphere itself had turned into a painting of mourning. Medieval chronicles tell similar tales, suns the colour of blood, twilight that never ended, and rains that stung the skin. The resemblance is not coincidence. It is proof that history repeats its storms and that human memory keeps their ash alive. When people in the Middle Ages saw the red mists and dying harvests, they did not speak of sulphur or aerosols. They spoke of sin and redemption. But beneath their prayers lay the same understanding we hold today, that nature is both destroyer and teacher, and that from the darkness of its fury knowledge is born. Volcanic ash does not simply darken the sky, it strangles the land. When sulphur dioxide and fine dust rise high into the atmosphere, they reflect sunlight back into space, cutting off the warmth that crops need to live. Wheat, barley, grapes and olives, staples of medieval life, failed one by one. In France and Italy, vines bore no fruit. Along the Mediterranean, olive trees dropped their leaves like tears. In the north, constant rain turned fields into swamps. Cattle and sheep died by the thousands, their bones scattered across wet meadows. With them perished the peasants' livelihood, leaving entire villages in ruin. Mould crept through grain stores and swarms of locusts arrived in the damp heat that followed every failed harvest. Monastic records from Flanders whisper of fields, silent as graveyards, where only the sound of hunger could be heard. The monks described the eerie stillness of mornings without birdsong, the rustle of empty barns, and the slow tolling of bells for the dead. This was not a single catastrophe, but a pattern repeated across centuries. The soil, once fertile, became a mirror of the sky, grey, exhausted, and waiting for mercy. Famine was only the first wound, disease was the second. After every great eruption, hunger paved the way for sickness. Malnutrition weakened the body, making it prey to fevers and plagues. Between the 14th and 15th centuries, the chill and crop failures of volcanic winters intertwined with the Black Death's march across Europe. In Norway and England, population numbers plunged as families vanished from their homesteads. In China, eruptions from Indonesia disrupted the monsoon, bringing erratic floods and droughts. The Song Dynasty's chronicles record villages empty of life, rivers choked with corpses, and officials pleading with heaven to relent. People turned to faith when the earth offered no answer. In churches, Processions of barefoot penitents carried candles through icy streets. In temples, incense rose toward a sun that no longer shone. Across the world, despair united humanity more than trade or empire ever had. Modern climatology now shows how these disasters were connected, how one eruption could shake multiple continents. Yet what endures in the historical record is not just the science, but the silence, the image of entire generations standing beneath darkened skies, realising that they had angered something far greater than themselves. Centuries later, the ice began to speak. From the frozen depths of Greenland and Antarctica, scientists drilled cores that preserved the breath of ancient eruptions. Layer by layer, the ice revealed a ghostly calendar, thin bands of dust, sudden spikes of sulphur, traces of ash invisible to the naked eye. These were the signatures of forgotten disasters, volcanic winters so immense that they reshaped the climate of the entire world. At least 15 colossal eruptions occurred between the years 500 and 1500. One of the most powerful came in 1257, when Mount Somalis in Indonesia exploded with a force greater than Krakatoa. For months afterward, the sky dimmed across continents. Europe recorded four years of frost and blight. In 1258, the people of London held public prayers because the sun no longer shone. Only in the 21st century did scientists match the chemical fingerprints of those icy layers with the volcanic soil of Lombok. The past had finally confessed. What monks once called divine punishment was, in truth, the Earth's own machinery at work, indifferent, magnificent, and terrifying. Each discovery deepens not despair, but understanding. It reminds us that the past still breathes beneath our feet, that the dust of every eruption lingers in the air we share, and that history is not written only in ink, but also in ice. The people of the Middle Ages could not silence the mountains, but they learned to listen to them. 
out of the ashes of catastrophe came adaptation. Farmers began to plant hardier crops, oats, rye, and turnips that could endure cold and thin sunlight. They built granaries for lean years and developed methods to salt, dry, and smoke their food. In Venice, merchants stocked Egyptian grain to survive future famines. In Japan, Buddhist monks observed the timing of the rains and snows, creating early forms of weather records. Across monasteries in Europe, scholars began noting celestial events and harvest patterns, unknowingly laying the foundation for meteorology. The volcanic winters, though cruel, became silent teachers. They forced humanity to move, to trade, to innovate. Even in desolation, the instinct to prepare, to protect one's neighbour as well as oneself, flourished. From burnt fields rose the first sparks of collective intelligence. What began as mere endurance grew into wisdom. People no longer saw the world as static, but as a living system, vast and unpredictable. Every eruption was a warning, every recovery a triumph. Through fear, humans learned humility, and through humility, survival. When the skies dimmed and crops failed, faith became both refuge and language. Churches across Europe organised processions beneath ashen clouds, chanting hymns to drive away divine wrath. Bells rang through frozen villages, their echoes mingling with the sound of the wind. For the medieval mind, each natural tremor was a message, each red sunset a warning of judgment day. Art, too, absorbed the gloom. Painters filled their manuscripts with darkened suns and bleeding skies. Cathedrals rose higher and narrower, their gothic arches pointing toward salvation. The stained glass windows, pierced by the faint light that remained, were not merely decoration, but confession, a yearning to let heaven's warmth touch the earth again. Even in despair, beauty persisted. Chroniclers described the dim world not only with fear, but with awe. The fog, they said, made the world holy. Every candle was a star, every prayer a defiance of the void. In these centuries of darkness, people began to record not just miracles, but patterns of seasons, floods and eclipses. What began as theology slowly turned into observation. Out of fear was born curiosity. Out of faith, the early seeds of science. The Gothic shadow gave birth to enlightenment, proving that even the darkest ages carry within them the first light of understanding. Every volcanic winter is a reminder that the earth is older, wiser and more powerful than us. Its anger can silence kingdoms, erase harvests and turn sunlight into memory. Yet it also reveals something immortal within humankind, the ability to endure, adapt, and create meaning out of suffering. The ashes of the past did not only cover the soil, they fertilized knowledge. From famine grew cooperation, from silence grew observation, and from devastation grew empathy. The people who once starved under red skies unknowingly prepared the path for modern science, art, and resilience. When we look back at those medieval winters, we see more than tragedy. We see the earliest reflections of our shared fragility and courage. The monks writing by candlelight, the peasants planting in frost, the children praying for warmth. They all carried forward the same hope that sustains us today. Darkness, in the end, was not the enemy. It was the teacher. It showed humanity that survival is not about conquering the world, but about understanding it and each other. And so, the story of volcanic winters becomes not one of despair, but of rebirth, the quiet triumph of light learning to live again.